Let's go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for coming to our scientific seminar series here in the Center of Regional Health. Most of you know the drill. These little coupons back by that box, please put your name on one of them and drop it in the box so that we can keep track of how many people are coming to all these talks and continue to make the case that we are making good use of the funding we get to the seminar series, which primarily comes from the Matthew K. Beth Memorial Lecture Fund through the Division of Geriatric Medicine. So, uh, uh, once again, we want to acknowledge them and thank them for their generous support for this seminar series. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, but before I do that, I want to tell you that we already have another speaker lined up for one month from today, uh, March 5th. Uh, Mick Smyre from uh, Bucknell University will be talking, a guest of, of George Reebok. His talk, topic's going to be Graying Green, Climate Action for an Aging World. So uh, we'll see what that's all about, and I encourage uh, all of you to come back for that talk as well. Um, Today, we're very fortunate to have with us uh, Dr. George Demiris from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and I, I spent a little bit of time looking through uh, George's CV tonight, so I'm going to try to give a brief introduction uh, and then let him take over. Uh, but George um, grew up in Greece and then went to uh, college in uh, Germany at the University of Heidelberg, where he got a bachelor's and then a master's degree in medical informatics. After that, he moved to the United States and enrolled at the University of Minnesota where he got a, doctor, a PhD in health informatics in uh, 2000. Um, George has been very, very prolific. So his very first publication also was in 2000 uh, in uh, the Journal of Telemedicine and Telecare, where he was the first author on a paper, a questionnaire for the assessment of patients' impressions of the risks and benefits of home telecare. Um, so that was his first paper in the year 2000. Here it is, just turned into 2018. And he already has over 200 peer-reviewed publications, so he's been cranking it out. While he's been doing all that, he's uh, done a little bit of traveling around, a little bit of moving. So after uh, he got his PhD from the University of Minnesota, he took a faculty position at the University of Missouri. Um, and uh, from there, uh, moved uh, on to the uh, University of Washington, where he was ultimately promoted to become a full professor of behavioral, biobehavioral nursing and health systems in the School of Nursing at the University of Washington and also had a joint appointment in the University of Washington School of Medicine. Um, he was also the vice chair of the informatics education uh, department of biomedical informatics uh, and medical education at the University of Washington. So he was doing great. Things were going really well for him at the University of Washington in Seattle. By the way, I first met George when he was uh, out here interviewing for one of our Bloomberg distinguished professorships. Uh, he didn't get it, but I met him and then um, immediately recruited him to be a member of our Royal Center Advisory Committee meeting, and he's staying overnight and is going to participate in our Advisory Committee meeting tomorrow. And George, I want to commend you for a number of things. Among other things, is on page 44 of your 53-page CV, he lists his service on our External Advisory Committee as his external professional services, so very complete and, and good to see that you remember uh, that you're uh, helping us out in, in a big way. Um, anyway, after uh, working at uh, University of Washington just recently, uh, George was promoted and has accepted a position as the as a Penn Integrates Knowledge University professor in the Department of Biobehavioral and Health Sciences in the School of Nursing in uh, University of Pennsylvania, and also has joint appointments in the Department of Biophysics, Epidemiology, and Informatics of the Perelman uh, School of Medicine in the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so um, I'm looking forward to hearing what George has to say today, and the title of this talk is Personal Health Technologies for Older Adults and their families. Let's welcome George. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. And as David said, I've had the chance to learn a little bit more about what the Center on Aging and Health does. And I'm always eager when I come back to learn more about the great projects that you have. Today, I want to take the time to talk a little bit about some of the projects that we're pursuing, specifically focusing on informatics technologies and targeting older adults and their families. So we're looking at information technology use because we all anticipate that with such tools, we can increase access uh, to information, bridge geographic distance, and uh, improve communication and have uh, older adults and their families become more engaged in the process of care. Or at least that's the hypothesis in a lot of the projects that uh, I will be describing today. The idea with those uh, tools when they are uh, designed to have people become more engaged is that they can also facilitate a shift from institution-centric to patient-centered uh, systems of care. 
Uh, so I will try and give you a few examples from uh, ongoing research uh, that we are um, pursuing. Uh, and as you will see, those are very distinct uh, examples in terms of the target audience and the settings in which they take place. But I'm hoping to highlight with those examples some of the opportunities that we have when we think about the role of informatics and information technology more broadly to support older adults, but also perhaps some of the challenges that may come with that. So the three examples I'm focusing on today have to do with the settings of hospice, Internet of Things and caregiving and embodied conversational agents. So the first example is from the work we're doing in the space of hospice and primarily targeting hospice caregivers. And when I talk about caregivers in this context, I'm referring to the family members, friends, spouses or others who assume the often unpaid caregiving role for a patient at the end of life. Um, we are doing this work as part of the Hospice Caregiving Research Network. This is basically a team of researchers committed to supporting caregivers of patients at the end of life and looking at technology not as an intervention, but rather as potentially useful tools to facilitate interventions that will help caregivers cope during these stressful times. So I'm sure you're all familiar, but basically when we think about hospice, we really think about the palliative and passionate care that is needed and delivered to patients and their families when the patient is approaching end of life. Uh, and more formally in the United States, that means with a prognosis of life for six months or less. Uh, and the idea there is to allow people to approach end of life with dignity and comfort uh, but one of the things that is characteristic of hospice care is that uh, there is a diet that are the recipients of the services. It's the patient and the family, and they become the unit of care. Uh, and it's their pay, uh, beliefs, needs, and preferences that should be governing the decisions pertaining to care. Uh, caregivers play a very important role. Not only are they asked to carry out a series of tasks, sometimes physically demanding, and sometimes important from a clinical or pharmaceutical perspective, even though people often have little or no training, but they're often also asked to serve as proxies for important decision-making when the patients cannot make decisions for themselves. And when you look at the palliative care and hospice care literature, the caregivers find that that experience may be a fulfilling one, assuming a, a caregiving role for a loved one at the end of life, but also at the same time, there is evidence that people feel that sometimes, even though their needs and preferences are supposed to be addressed, little attention is paid to those, or while uh, our hospice agencies are struggling to engage caregivers in the process of care, we may not necessarily have the protocols or the right tools to um, provide guidelines for the inclusion of the families in the decision-making process. And when you look at the literature, there's some interventions primarily focusing on the patients or the healthcare providers in terms of palliative care and hospice and more specifically hospice, but we don't have a sufficient number of interventions that uh, look at the caregivers needs in that space. Obviously there's a lot of interventions more broadly for caregivers of patients with chronic conditions, but when you look specifically in hospice, there's not that big of an evidence base. So we looked at this specific example I'm uh, describing a problem solving therapy as one way to provide uh, supportive services for family caregivers. The idea here is with the traditional problem solving therapy that you have a self-directed cognitive behavioral process whereby you're trying to understand what the challenge is and uh, develop strategies or uh, solutions that may help you address that situation. And problem solving therapy is obviously an approach that is supposed to work both with general uh, problems in life, but also with very stressful situations. Um, <clears throat> and it has been found to be effective in various caregiver populations. And there was even a study prior to us starting this work that looked at a coping intervention based on problem solving therapy that was specifically delivered to hospice caregivers and was found to be effective but uh, quite costly in that it required at least five to six additional visits by a hospice social worker uh, to meet privately with the caregivers. The problem with those types of interventions, when we try them out in a research setting and we use our research funds to support the delivery of the intervention, is as you all are aware, uh, 
that we don't often translate them into practice because many times agencies will struggle to identify funds to maintain those types of um, visits or sessions that are part of the intervention. So in this work, we started looking at technology not as the intervention that is going to provide help for the caregivers, but rather as one tool that may facilitate a more effective or more cost-effective, perhaps, uh, alternative to deliver some of those intervention sessions. There has been plenty of um, work done that demonstrates that video is an effective platform when you have interventions that may have nonverbal elements that may be important in terms of conveying empathy or improving communication. So we looked at video conferencing as a tool to examine how such an intervention would be delivered in, uh, in a way that perhaps could be effective, but um, would also be perhaps uh, saving money. Uh, and, and also, I think I mentioned this already, the goal here is not to replace actual visits. So we were not trying to use technology to reduce in-person contact with the hospice agencies, but rather the technology was used to add services, the problem-solving therapy sessions that were not part of the regular hospice plan, uh, and use the technology in those cases to uh, provide those additional supportive services. So we conducted a clinical trial that was called uh, PISIS, Problem-Solving Intervention to Support Caregivers in End-of-Life Care Settings. And uh, this was a three-arm clinical trial um, where our hospice caregivers were uh, randomly assigned to one of three groups. One group was the attention control group where basically people received standard care with uh, and the same number of friendly visits or friendly phone calls by an intervention is just to match the amount of attention that our intervention folks re were receiving because of the intervention. And then we have two intervention groups, one where people were receiving the problem solving therapy sessions in person and one where they were receiving them uh, via video. Uh, and just briefly to mention that this intervention was based on the problem solving therapy framework. What we did was, in terms of the intervention material and the curriculum, make it more specific for hospice. Not only in terms of the examples that the different intervention material included, but also in terms of the frequency and the duration, acknowledging the fact that caregivers in these situations are often stressed out, they have very little time, they have a lot of people coming in and going. You have to be flexible in your protocol because people have a lot of unexpected things happening. And also, uh, we made some modifications based on extensive pilot work that we had conducted prior to this clinical trial. So the first thing that we had learned from our pilot work was that we needed to be flexible in the technology selection. Traditionally, with NIH grants, reviewers really like to see a consistent tool used for everybody in the study. So in the early stages of this research, when we were proposing a video conferencing system, everybody had to use the exact same system. But what happened with uh, situations where people live at home is that you cannot control for the residential infrastructure. We did have people who had computers and internet access and were already using sophisticated video conferencing for their own purposes. So they would not be willing to go to a, a modern based video phone. But we also had people who did not have uh, a computer or internet access at home. So we developed a toolkit that had various solutions depending on the residential infrastructure so that everybody could participate. Uh, and people who did not have internet or computers and were not willing to use them would still be able to participate through commercially available video phones. I say commercially available, although probably they're no longer commercially available, but those are video phones that you would plug into your phone line with a picture frame and they had low quality modern based uh, video conferencing. The second issue we uh, modified from our original planning and before starting this clinical trial based on extensive pilot work was that we were, uh, we decided to include caregivers throughout their experience in the study. In the original pilot work, caregivers had to be in the study while they were active caregivers. So when their loved one passed away, they would no longer be in the study, but we received a lot of feedback from participants who felt that the sessions and the problem-solving therapy approach was beneficial to them even, or perhaps even more 
during the bereavement phase. So we actually allowed people to stay uh, in the study during the bereavement phase as well uh, for this uh, clinical trial. So this was a clinical trial for four years. We recruited a total of 514 family caregivers. And overall, when it came to technology, people uh, showed great levels of acceptance. It's interesting that in those four years, technology became perhaps more pervasive and more accessible when it comes to video conferencing, so that participants towards the end of the study seem to be quite familiar with Skype and all kinds of other different video conferencing tools. Um, and they also uh, had a level of sophistication in terms of technology use that indicated in many cases for people they indicated to us different uses besides that intervention. For example, using the video conferencing platform to interact with a medical director, or several people talked about wanting to have uh, peer support groups with other caregivers where they could use the video platform as well. In terms of their overall perception, the video was found to be beneficial, more so than having the same conversations uh, um, compared to regular phone. Uh, people talked about having the face behind the voice, uh, the, the idea that even though they thought at first it would not make a difference, they did realize that being able to not only hear but see the intervention is allowed for establishing rapport and having a more meaningful conversation. And also the intervention is reported being able to interpret silence and all those nonverbal elements that you normally don't necessarily capture in, let's say, a regular phone interaction. So the findings are of mixed um, value to us. Uh, the great exciting thing, starting with the positive news, is that the intervention is a beneficial one. Compared to the attention control, the caregivers in the face-to-face -face group had reduced anxiety and improved quality of life. And that was uh, a statistically significant difference and also one that was sustained over time because we had multiple time points for collecting these uh, parameters. Uh, so at least there is significant promise in a problem solving therapy protocol that is specific for hospice and the, the context of hospice caregivers. Um, however, there were no differences in caregivers in the video condition compared to the attention control condition. And so that is less exciting, obviously, in that uh, we were not able to show that the two modalities were comparable or um, that they one that, that they were um, um, equal in terms of uh, their impact on outcomes. And we have different theories for why that is. One um, potential explanation for why the video platform was not as effective was that uh, we had participants in that group receive all intervention sessions on video. Uh, and so they never had a meeting with the interventionist in person. They met study staff that went over the consent during the consent visit and the initial assessments, but the actual interventionist with whom they discussed pretty sensitive topics was a person they only saw on the screen. And we think that perhaps they didn't feel like they were establishing rapport or it was harder to be as effective in disclosing and discussing sensitive topics with somebody they have, were not meeting in person. Another issue that we think played a role is that the technology worked for most of the times really um, with no glitches and quite uh, high quality of uh, video. Um, we had actually a technical quality assessment, both a subjective one and a more objective one where we looked at the, 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 the quality of the image and the audio. And the technology worked really well most of the times. However, the few times it didn't work well, uh, it had quite a big impact. For example, when people were disclosing sensitive topics or were crying, were clearly emotional, talking about the fear of their loved one dying in the midst of this, having um, a connection that was lost or a frozen image where they were not really sure if the interventionist was listening or was no longer there and the image just froze. So there were a few technical problems, but then when those occur, they did seem to have quite a significant impact. And finally, there's this whole notion of the attention control, which uh, I'm not gonna go into now, but it's in and of itself a somewhat controversial discussion around is an attention control group perhaps an intervention 
as well, given that in our exit interviews, people in the attention control talked about how this was the best service they had ever received. So clearly there was some benefit to, to that group as well. So in the next steps, we have a, a renewal now for this R1 that we're continuing with a clinical trial that's looking at mod modifications based on those lessons learned. First of all, we're examining a hybrid platform for the, for the delivery where the first of these intervention sessions is taking place in person with the hope that um, they would be able to meet the interventionists and establish some report before moving on to video sessions. We're not giving up on the video yet in terms of uh, trying to come up with a cost-effective solution, especially because our participating hospice agencies have indicated interest in sustaining that intervention, but not with added uh, travel. So we have to look at ways to uh, support that delivery. We're also looking at other technologies to supplement the video components, such as a portal or web-based tools for asynchronous communication and videos that can be used to uh, allow people to go over some of the material, not just in a synchronous fashion, while both interventionists and the caregiver are available at the same time. And then we also are modifying the curriculum to add some positive uh, appraisal uh, elements. Uh, a lot of our participants talked about not wanting to define caregiving only in the sense of a list of problems, but rather uh, trying to make more sense and meaning out of an, uh, an experience that was very valuable to them. And positive reappraisal has often been found to, in other settings, to be beneficial when combined with um, problem solving therapy. So our new intervention is the modified version based on this called Pisces Plus and we are about to start enrollment for this in the Philadelphia area, uh, hopefully uh, the beginning of March. The first example I described, if you didn't have any sophisticated technologies, it was commercially available. Actually, we used a system similar to Skype called VC, which is supposed to have HIPAA compliance and have higher levels of encryption but basically a system that's accessible to people and it's supposed to uh, just um, use something that people were in many cases using already for other purposes. The second example I'm going to be describing has to do again with technologies that are available and we're using uh, for other purposes in our lives, but more and more we see uh, that they may be playing a role in allowing people to stay independent. And I'm specifically talking about Internet of Things and smart home technologies. So before I go into the definitions and talk about the specific project, um, I want to uh, mention or emphasize the, the emergence of this area of behavioral sensing, where we're using different technologies, whether it's passive monitoring or wearable technologies, that allow you to get better information about people's behaviors. Um, so passive monitoring refers to all those technologies that you do not have to, as user, operate or learn how to operate. Things like sensors that are embedded in the residential infrastructure. Uh, things that are there and you don't have to use, but they still collect data would be passive monitoring solutions. And wearables are obviously um, uh, growing in terms of usage and uh, dissemination, and we see that different age groups are adapting all kinds of wearable technologies for fitness, for activity monitoring, and so forth. The idea behind behavioral sense and technologies is that we would be able to objectively, remotely, and continuously measure aspects of patient physiology, behavior, and symptoms. And this could potentially be beneficial, not just for research studies, but also when we try to understand what is going on with people's lives and when would be a time that we need to pay more attention or intervene before a catastrophic event occurs. So we um, see that there are many anticipated benefits with behavioral sensing. We get to capture uh, activities of daily living and behavior outside of a clinical um, setting and outside of a laboratory and reducing reliance on human observers. So we don't actually have to have people come in to a lab to perform activities. We can uh, get that information about what people are doing in their homes and in communities. And we do not have to rely on self-report. Uh, we all know that there's challenges with the accuracy of self-reporting. People tend to over or underestimate 
for example, their sleep quality or their overall activity levels. Um, and this would also facilitate a shift from episodic to continuous monitoring. So rather than being monitored or assessed for certain parameters once every few months or whenever you have a clinical encounter, this would be continuous monitoring every day, every hour. Um, in the real world, not in the laboratory. The goal behind behavioral sensing is obviously not to have somebody at the other end watch those data points come in in real time, but rather to design hopefully effective and reliable algorithms that would be able to allow us to extract information and detect when somebody's activities or behavior or whatever it is we're measuring might be deviating from what would be considered the norm for that individual. And to perhaps uh, in a more timely manner, identify an issue before you wait for an adverse event to indicate that there was something wrong. So in, the, uh, in this context, we've seen more and more the use of the term smart home to, to refer to a residential setting that has passive monitoring technology embedded in the residential infrastructure with a goal to monitor the residents for maximizing their independence and their well-being and safety. In the last few years, we hear more about Internet of Things, which refers to a network of interconnected devices. And we have seen several applications for security or for entertainment, where you can remotely control devices that are interconnected uh, and can exchange data among themselves. So not just having um, sensors in the home, but for example, having those types of sensors where if the temperature uh, goes above a certain point, another device will respond to that, and you can control all of that remotely as a user or have a dashboard to be able to control movement, temperature, and what is going on in your home from a distance. With uh, smart home Internet of Things sensors, you will see that there's already a broad spectrum and most of them are also commercially available. And those are different types of sensors and switches that are supposed to not only assess what is going on in the home, but also allow you to remotely control for those devices. Uh, whether those are monitors, I mean, I'm sorry, motion sensors that detect uh, motion or even cameras that allow you to remotely control the camera um, and even uh, pressure sensors to detect when somebody's sitting or standing and other electronic devices throughout the home. So we have in this specific pro proposal focused on older adults who are community dwelling uh, and want to maintain their independence at home and engage the family caregivers. In many cases, people who are not in the same residence. In many cases in our project, those are distant family caregivers who live more than 25 miles away. And obviously, I don't need to explain to this group that the family caregiving, um, uh, the, the, the challenges with family caregiving and the fact that we rely on family caregivers, our system does to allow for providing support for older adults. And so um, a lot of the um, um, anticipated benefits of those devices is not only that you would be able to see what people are doing in their home, but, because, but and use that information to detect abnormalities or certain events, but perhaps use that same information to better help for planning and executing of uh, caregiving tasks. And there's a plethora of those tasks that may need more information so that caregivers can provide more personalized uh, and more effective services to their family members or others. <clears throat> so, um, when you think about Internet of Things technologies, you can have them as a tool to provide real-time and aggregate information on various things, and this include environmental parameters. A lot of those devices and sensors capture not only human activity, but things like the temperature, luminosity, humidity in the home. Uh, how active somebody is in the home, the number of visitors they have, uh, whether they are engaging in sedentary behavior, uh, are preparing meals, or engaged in daily hygiene patterns. And so it allows for people to perhaps um, communicate with their loved one, uh, whether this is to remind them or warn them or uh, 
encourage them to engage in certain activities or to more effectively coordinate services. So we have an ongoing project that looks at uh, the use of Internet of Things technologies as a smart home intervention for older adults and caregivers. And this is funded by the National Science Foundation. The goal here is to see how these um, systems could be beneficial to uh, families and older adults themselves in terms of um, decision making, but also to better understand uh, potential concerns or challenges that uh, these groups may see with the use of these technologies. So we are um, uh, deploying different Internet of Things technologies to community dwelling older adults and um, we're following them for at least six months. Um, and in that period, we have three semi-structured interviews at the beginning, midpoint, and exit. And we're focusing primarily on how we could use these data sets that are generated by the sensors. And more specifically, how do we design visualizations that are um, meaningful to uh, older adults and their families so that they can make most sense of the data that are being captured about themselves. So uh, when our participants come into the study, they do have a choice as to what sensors they want to install in the home. They get a pretty detailed list and an explanation of what each of the sensors um, does. And in order for them to be in the study, they have to choose at least one sensor. Several of our participants choose multiple sensors. Uh, but we try to capture uh, a broad spectrum of sensors in terms of what they measure, but also in terms of how intrusive they might be perceived. So we have things like door and window sensors that capture um, whether you open or close the door, the window, the cupboard, the refrigerator door. Similarly, multi-sensors that in addition to motion measure environmental parameters like temperature, humidity, luminosity. And we have uh, pressure sensors, bed sensors, but also even a wireless camera, um, which we know that is something that people don't traditionally consider as a, as a monitoring technology they would welcome in their home. However, in our study so far, we did have three participants who chose that as an option. Um, the idea here is to better understand what people would choose and why in terms of monitoring technologies. And we are interested in finding out why people choose different sensors and, uh, over others. Uh, what is their perception and the perceived need and benefit that they see with that technology? So once people have selected which sensors they want in their home, we go in and install them in different places. Um, and the idea is that it's somewhat not um, too visible, I guess, uh, but if you do look closely, you will see all kinds of sensors. This is an example of one of those residences. Um, and then we are uh, capturing the data. The data are all collected into one server. They're stored in the cloud. Um, and we are trying to develop algorithms to make inferences about the activities of daily living. For example, that uh, people engage in certain patterns like watching TV, meal preparation, bathroom visits, restlessness at night, and so forth. Um, additionally, we are trying to uh, capture the overall activity level or how much activity is taking place in the home based on the frequency and intensity of the firings of the motion sensors. Um, what we think uh, is uh, one of the factors that may determine whether people will continue to use these technologies is whether they can make sense of the data that are collected about themselves. So we do have a dashboard that people can access on the web so that they and their family members, if they choose to have family members have that access, can see the data that the sensors collect. The biggest challenge, as I mentioned before, is the visualization. So we're doing a series of focus groups and interviews uh, and some participatory design sessions to better understand what those visualizations should look like in terms of making uh, most use of the information. Um, and this is not an easy task because people have different needs and preferences and our participants have also different uh, paradigms because they have varying degrees of computer familiarity. So some participants have a software that they use for something else and they would really like our dashboard to look just like that. 
Others have never used any type of software before in terms of monitoring activity, so they uh, perhaps have very different needs. Um, I'm not going to go over the specific examples, but I'm including them only to show you the different um, um, views that we have created. And obviously, there are different needs and views for the different stakeholder groups. Uh, when we do focus groups with our older adults, they have very different things that they expect from the data versus our clinicians and the family members. The one on the left corner you can see is a blueprint of the home and the um, dots. Um, um, you can see them uh, in terms of uh, where the person is in the home moving and the level of activity uh, is indicated by the uh, flashing of the dots or the color of the dots. And then density maps that you can see in the right corner um, are quite popular in the smart home literature, but they're not really that easily understood and accessible by our participants, but it is a good tool for researchers, perhaps. This indicates the level of motion in the home per hour, and uh, it's color coded so that you can easily see, for example, when it's wide in this specific example, there's no motion, so that would mean somebody's usually sleeping, and when it's black, it means they're outside their apartment, so you can see if they're regular in terms of when they leave their home for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Again, those might be useful for one group that's trying to look at certain patterns over a long period of time, but less useful for another group that may be using these to annotate and document more as a diary function. We have, for example, participants who really want to use the visualizations to be able to list who visited them that day, not just that they had visitors. And that may not be necessarily clinically useful information, but it's useful information to those participants. And in many cases, the family members um, will want different degrees of granularity in the data. Again, the challenge is to create multiple views for data over time, but then also be able to zoom in and look at the individual daily patterns. Um, we are uh, we have recruited 48 participants and we are expected to recruit another 12 in the next few months, hopefully. Uh, like I said, we're monitoring people for about six months each and um, we have been creating um, those visualization prototypes in iterative design approach so the new cohort of people get to see the refined or improved versions based on the feedback from our previous participants. Um, and we're trying to better understand what are some of the uh, perceptions that people have in terms of the utility of the sensors, but also concerns around privacy and the security uh, around data exchange. And then finally, the third example I want to briefly mention is some work we're doing with embodied conversational agents uh, or digital companion tools for older adults. And again, this is technology that is becoming more and more uh, common, but uh, it's one of those areas where we still have a lot of room to consider both the benefits as well as the risks and the challenges. So we know that information uh, and communication technologies can engage older adults and also older adults with some cognitive impairment because this is the group that we targeted in this example. Um, and in those cases, the technology can be used to mitigate specific impairments such as memory deficits, for example, or uh, have a, an approach that focuses on maximizing continuing abilities. So using emotional, uh, promoting emotional memory, sensory awareness, and so forth. And various applications are now being used or developed to address social isolation and loneliness. So in this work, we focused on digital companion tools or embedded, uh, embodied conversational agents uh, and those are basically systems that are designed to interact with users through both verbal and nonverbal behavior cues. And in some cases, they're anthropomorphic or they're cartoon-like. They might be using an avatar uh, that has features that may be familiar to um, uh, human features. And then also in terms of the communication, there's pacing and intonation that allows people to have the feeling they're in, uh, communicating with a conversation partner. And this is an emerging area. There's several uh, conversational agents that have been designed for people with cognitive impairment or for various other uh, groups. The problem is, as, is with a lot of technologies that are relatively new, that we have a small number of studies. 
And most of the conversational agents, um, the study around them has been done usually in laboratory settings. So you basically invite people to um, a clinical or laboratory site and have them interact with the conversational agent for a few um, hours or an hourly session many times, but uh, this is not often done in the natural environment, let's say in somebody's home, uh, or some of the studies have been done with only one person who took the system in their home. So we are lacking some of the um, real world deployments in longitudinal assessment. Um, a lot of the conversational agents will have one specific attribute or feature. For example, they may engage only in conversation to address social isolation, or they may have a single purpose like uh, providing um, reminders for medication or for exercising or showing pictures and videos uh, for um, reminiscence therapy. So we try to do in our pilot uh, a visibility of digital companion systems, but we really wanted to have those deployed in real world settings used by older adults with mild cognitive impairment. And we wanted that to be for a longer period of time. So not just have people come in for a session, but actually have the conversational agent in their home, preferably for several weeks and months. So we looked at the system that was commercially available, that was comprehensive in its functionality. So it wasn't just about communication, but rather a system that engaged uh, with communication for social interactions. Uh, and we tried to see, oh, and it also had reminders. It did use the multimedia features to show pictures and videos. And we wanted to see if such a system would be perceived as useful by all drug adults and also um, assess how this system would work in terms of its impact on people's social interactions, anxiety, and depressive symptoms. So each participant was invited to be in the study for three months. And uh, we recruited community dwelling older adults with mild cognitive impairment. So the system we used, like, as I mentioned, is a commercially available one, and it was uh, at the time called Jerry Joy, uh, but now it's called Care Coach, which is also the name of the company. And the uh, system is one that has a virtual pet that is displayed on a tablet. And the um, system interacts with the older adult through voice and expression. Uh, you can tell when the system is not, uh, it also has a video camera, so it can see you if you activate that feature. Um, and uh, you can see when they're not, when the pet is not looking at you because it will be sleeping and you have its eyes closed. When it opens its eyes, the camera is on as well, unless you have it covered, which is what a lot of our participants did. Um, and you can talk to the pet at any time. There's trained staff members at the other end that are available to respond to the questions. Um, what they do is they type the response. So then that response is, uh, um, converted to audible speech, uh, and because they are using the pet, that allows for a voice that would be, I guess, what the designers thought would sound like if your pet talked to you. Uh, and uh, the system, in addition to having that conversation with the user, can also be programmed to provide reminders and prompts using pictures and multimedia to facilitate sensory awareness and memory support. There is also a portal for family members and the family members can log in and enter specific things that they would want the pet or the digital avatar to be addressing in those conversations. For example, don't forget to take your medication, don't forget to exercise or drink water. Um, and this could be potentially something that a clinician could utilize as well. Although in this study, it was just for our older adults and their family members. So every one of our participants received a digital companionship device, the tablet with the avatar for use for three months. And we did uh, interviews at baseline midpoint in three months. And obviously this was just a feasibility study, but we still wanted to get some preliminary data in terms of what potential impact the system could have in the future. And so we looked at uh, social support, overall health, anxiety, and depression. And we used the comfort from digital companion animal scan uh, which is an existing scale to basically understand whether people are interacting and bonding with the system over time or not. So, and I don't know if you can see all the details, but when you look at the 
age range, our average age was 78.5 years. And uh, all our participants, all our 10 participants in this feasibility study were female. And uh, one was Native American, everybody else was white. Um, the uh, <clears throat> group that participated in the study was diverse in terms of technology experience, but also in terms of comfort using technology. And so we had some people who never use technology or strongly dislike using technology for leisure and a lot of people in between. <clears throat> when you look at the data, um, the, there were obviously uh, findings that uh, should not mean much given the very small sample size, uh, but uh, you can see that there was a slight improvement in cognition uh, as well as social support, but those are not statistically significant findings. Again, it's a very small sample size, uh, but you will also see that the anxiety went up for people towards the end of the study. Um, and while the findings may be going in the right direction, again, I want to emphasize it was a very small sample size, and we were trying to primarily focus on whether this would work and get more qualitative data in terms of the experience that people had with that tool. In terms of the increase in anxiety, one potential explanation could also be because we saw that towards the end of the study that some people were anxious about giving up the pay. This was not the case for most people, but there were some who had developed an attachment and um, two people kept talking about being um, quite anxious about giving up the, the digital pay. And this uh, introduced to us a, a concern that we hadn't really fully addressed when we were doing our own IRB application, which is what happens when people become too attached to um, a digital companion like this in a study that is supposed to be of limited duration. So when we looked at why people were signing up for the study, a lot of people talked about just uh, the excitement, trying something new, um, and only one person talked about looking for a replacement for a pen. A lot of times with digital pets, the premise for their use is that literature demonstrates the clear benefits of having real pets. Uh, and so in some cases, especially when people for various reasons, including cognitive or functional limitations or policies of retirement communities or long-term facilities are not able to have real pets. So in many cases with the studies that look at robotic or digital pets, the idea is that you could perhaps have some benefits <coughs> from a digital form of pens. Uh, in our study, there were not that many people who used that as the motivation for participating. But like I said, we did have two people who specifically said they wanted to have some form of a pen, even though it was not a real pen. So uh, when people uh, participated in the study, they did seem to find specific benefits with the use. Um, people talked about having somebody who would check on them and make sure that they're okay. Uh, having a virtual companion who they could talk to if they felt that they were not safe or needed help with something. Um, uh, people also talked about the benefit they saw in having informal conversations, uh, reminders, um, uh, whenever the, the digital pad would send them uh, positive notes or birthday wishes. Um, and also, uh, because the, the pet would engage in conversations and would show pictures uh, based on what the participant would say was their favorite uh, animal or plant, uh, they in many cases felt that the pet was very responsive and that they were tailoring their responses to the preferences of uh, the older adult. Um, people also talked about the fact that uh, the, the, this was a digital tablet that people didn't really uh, have uh, um, a pet with a physical presence or something that they could actually touch. Communication was in some cases problematic. They felt that the pet had limited vocabulary. The avatar was being repetitive in questions, that they were in some cases not remembering details of previous conversations or interrupting at inappropriate times. Um, and um, the, the um, experiences that people had 
with their conversation partners were quite different and across the board. We did have participants who felt that the conversations were very meaningful and uh, especially the two people who uh, grew a, a certain attachment to the avatar felt that the conversations were meaningful, important, deep and uh, valuable. But a lot of other participants felt the conversation, like I said, were repetitive or superficial or just uh, um, primarily small talk. Uh, interestingly enough, when uh, participants were asked to participate in this uh, study, they had a choice to engage family members as well. And so uh, our older adults could decide if they wanted to have a family member also sign up for the study. Uh, along with them, and none of the 10 participants chose a family member to be part of the study. In some cases, it was because people wanted to better understand what the system does before they would bother or, as they said, or uh, involve a, a family member. But in some other cases, it was that people felt that they, um, that they didn't need to have a family member be involved uh, in something that looked more like um, private conversations or entertainment. Uh, and the feature that was uh, included in the system where the family members could uh, program reminders or other messages through the portal was obviously not used since we didn't have family member participants. So in all those technologies that I've described, in many cases you hear that uh, the term of obtrusiveness and in some instances we uh, read that passive monitoring is non-obtrusive because you don't really have to operate. It is just there, so you don't have to learn how to use it. Um, and we have tried to come up with a more de formal definition of obtrusiveness that actually captures not just the aspect of usability. Clearly, if you have to use some software or hardware, there is a question as to how user-friendly this is. But obtrusiveness is much broader than that. It's really a summary evaluation by the user in terms of how uh, um, undesirable or physically or uh, psychologically prominent as undesirable features of the technology may be. And so in a lot of our interviews, we've used the um, obtrusiveness framework to guide some of our questions because there are multiple concepts that are captured under this whole notion of obtrusiveness. There is the physical dimension in terms of what the technology looks like and how it interferes with the physical environment. Uh, there is a usability dimension when people have to use some components, let's say a dashboard or other systems to operate the system. The biggest concern that we have with a lot of technologies when we introduce them in the home is the dimension of privacy. And here we're not only talking about the technical side of privacy and what we can do to encrypt or um, protect uh, servers and the data transfer, but also the subjective assessment of privacy that people may have. Meaning, if people think that the system is, for example, recording things that it's not recording, or people are afraid to go to the living room because there may be cameras there, you're introducing a new level of obtrusiveness that may not be necessarily reflected in the technological sign, but it's still something that affects people's experience. And there's also concerns around how the technology functions, how reliable it is, how people can maintain it in the long run, what effects it has on the human interactions. A lot of times in uh, home telecare and monitoring literature, you'll see that the consistent concern that people have is, does this mean I'll get to see my nurse less? Or does this mean my family members will visit less because they will be checking on me remotely? There is the whole dimension of the self-concept and how you see yourself in an environment that is uh, very technically, um, has all this infrastructure to monitor or, or turn your home to uh, um, a very high-tech environment. And the stigma that may come from this continuous monitoring, how it affects your daily routines, and whether you would be able to sustain the system in the long run, especially if you learn to depend on the data or the information it generates. From all these examples, there are some lessons learned that I think uh, apply across the board, even though those technologies are quite different and the target groups are quite different. Uh, first of all, something that we found over and over again, and it's now well documented, is that the assumption that older adults are technophobic is not valid. Uh, 
uh, and many ultra adults will embrace new technologies if they find them to be useful and, and usable. Uh, if they see a purpose and they think that they can use those technologies, they tend to, uh, in many cases, be open to the introduction of new tools. Uh, so it is important to assess the perceived ease of use and usefulness, but it's also important to engage older adults in the early stages of the design of such systems. Um, we are talking earlier about how various commercially available monitoring devices like blood pressure cuffs or pulse oximeters have never used um, older adults in the testing or um, even in the um, uh, early implementation phases, even though they are the main users of those devices. Uh, similarly, we did once a study uh, with a fall detection device that had been tested and was being marketed, and was made commercially available, but all the testing had uh, taken place in a laboratory with stunt actors who were trained to simulate the fall and how an older adult would fall, but it was never tested with actual older adults. Um, so this is obviously something that hopefully will become less of a challenge as people uh, pursue more inclusive design principles. We also need to consider unintended consequences when we introduce systems that are changing the way we communicate or interact with our network in our own home. We have to think about not only the benefits, but what could be some challenges that were originally not conceptualized with the introduction of these tools. Obviously, this applies to uh, paradigm shifts that will affect how we train our next generation of healthcare providers. Uh, we need to better understand how to integrate these tools uh, in uh, clinical practice once we know that we have the evidence that they work. Already, home care nurses are asked to use various telecare equipment uh, and remote monitoring solutions. So clearly, we are having more and more systems that facilitate patient-generated data, and we have to be prepared for a new reality where patients will want that data to be part of the decision-making about their own health and wellness. And finally, in all the systems, the technology may be a platform to deliver intervention, but isn't in and of itself the intervention. And when it makes more sense to deliver that intervention without the use of any advanced technology, we shouldn't be looking at the technology as a meaning as the end goal, but rather just as one of those tools. Um, so clearly there's uh, a lot of uh, new opportunities, but also challenges with the use and emergence of all those new devices and wearables and sensors. Um, so I'm hoping with the work I presented today to provide uh, um, a very quick overview of some of our lessons learned that have to do not only with the technology side, but with a lot of the uh, human side implications in terms of technology acceptance and use. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thank you for that question. I do think it's a great challenge. Some of the things we see now that are becoming more and more the norm, like team science, the fact that we have interdisciplinary teams, and the fact that there's more understanding for pragmatic trials, for participatory research, allows for those um, iterations in the study design as you go along. I think 
that one of the problems, for example, with uh, the more traditional smart home research in the earlier days was that everybody had to receive the exact same set of technologies, no matter whether they wanted more or less, and everything had to happen in a certain way, and you had to wait many years to figure out did this work or not. Um, I think there is now much more recognition that you want to maximize the translation of this into practice if you start adjusting and doing some quality improvement along the way. But it's still a challenge, I think, in terms of the um, training the next generation of healthcare providers. I have found for our work, one of the greatest challenges uh, is um, creating um, educational material or some type of um, outreach to improve um, data literacy across clinicians and uh, a lay audience. One of the challenges we have is that, you know, we develop these consent forms and we explain to people what they're signing up for. But I'm not convinced that people fully understand what they're signing up for. As a matter of fact, I shared an example earlier today with colleagues where um, we were doing once a study and one of the participants said they had no privacy concerns, uh, but whenever they were in the bathroom, they wanted to make sure they would get dressed behind the shower because they really thought that the motion sensor was a camera. And that was a participant who lived with the technology five months up to that point. Um, so I don't think people fully understand and we need to figure out ways to better explain and also allow for people to have the informed consent be a process rather than an event. People do change their mind and we, they should be able to and also be able to better understand um, implications. One of the unintended consequences, for example, with these technologies is uh, a lot of IRBs have traditionally focused on the resident in the home. What would happen if the resident doesn't like the camera anymore? What would happen um, you know, if uh, you find something troubling about the person? And those are very valid and important questions. But we've never thought about the visitors, for example. And what would happen if you have a home that captures everything about people inside the home and then you end up having visitors who are there to stay for maybe a day? Do you have them sign a consent for? So I think this whole uh, area of um, training, not just the healthcare providers, but all of us in terms of what is it that we're engaging in is one of those areas where I think it's still a challenge in terms of translating into practice. Yeah, thank you for that talk. Um, what you just said, I think, gets at what was on my mind. It has to do with the second part of your talk among the community dwelling with the adults and monitoring inside the home. I'd be curious what you've learned about what the older adults prefer and don't prefer. You know? mm -hmm. Because I think for many of them, Yeah, we found some interesting observations. One of them is that people um, are really, in our study, fascinated by the environmental monitoring, which we never thought would play any role. So the fact that the sensors capture the temperature, the humidity, and so forth is something that people are very interested in. Sometimes for their own reasons, they suspect that the house cleaner is adjusting the thermostat. Uh, but sometimes they do their own experiments. We had one participant who kept saying, I have seen that when the humidity goes up, I sleep better. Uh, I, I don't know how to what uh, extent that was actually a valid observation, but it was interesting that they were trying to combine the environmental data with the sleep quality data. Um, and this is something that people consistently value in the exit interview. The fact that they could see what was going on in their home in terms of the environment. And the other thing is that um, a lot of our participants have now accepted motion sensors and other technologies because they no longer carry the stigma that they're medical or clinical uh, sensors. They often will say, oh yes, we have them in my grocery store. I've seen the door sensors before. Yes, I can, I, I understand that. Or even though our study is not about intruders and safety, a lot of people reframe that and say, yes, I want to be part of this study because there's a lot of crime in my neighborhood. So they, they shift from a medical model to one of wellness in the context of safety. Um, 
And then finally, we have seen, um, and there's some other work that has similar findings. So obviously in our work, it's a smaller sample size, but we do see people who, um, where an adverse event has ameliorated some of their privacy concerns. So for example, people who have experienced a fall and were undetected on the floor for hours, they tend to be very open to the idea of cameras in the bedroom, in the living room, whereas other people obviously would never welcome the camera. So it's interesting that two people we have in the study who chose by themselves the camera are people who had experienced a fall and were undetected for a while. Um, so there's also the more objective assessment of what I think the technology may do in general, and then the more personal, the more rele the relevance to me and do I feel like I, this is going to benefit me. Um, I think it's uh, interesting that in, we've uh, partnered with a low income uh, housing facility and uh, the idea there was that people would not be perhaps as technologically savvy or as informed. And interestingly enough, our participants seem to be aware of the existence of those technologies in the community. They've seen it in other places. They talk about devices that they've seen in the library. So there is in increased awareness of various technologies. Um, we had several participants who talked about uh, uh, at the exit interview about rather than having a portal where they would go in and um, uh, look at what's going on with their daily living. Why couldn't we use something like Alexa or a speaker that would summarize what is going on uh, with them? Uh, which I found pretty interesting because we originally started with, oh, we need to make this low tech, people won't even know what's going on. And, and oftentimes people surprise us by suggesting more, more sophisticated solutions. Um, I can briefly answer that first. <laughs> so, um, uh, yes, and, and thank you for that observation. I think this is a very important point to consider. Where we see that quite clearly is in terms of the visualization. So we have some participants who will clearly say, I'm not going to be looking at this ever, so you need to talk to my daughter or my son because they need to be accessing this portal. And they do have one to never even look at, at the data. And then other participants who not only want to look at the data, but they talk about, I need to decide if this gets shared with my clinician. At all times, I need to be in control. Uh, and similarly, they need to annotate data. We have some people who are quite informed, and when they look at the graphs, they say, oh yeah, that day I had three visitors, and I'll tell you who they were and why they were here. And other people who are not as interested in becoming that engaged. Um, I think what is important when we think about patient empowerment and all those technologies that are supposed to engage people is um, the fact that not everybody wants to necessarily be actively involved. And so that needs to also be assessed in terms of do they want to have family members play a more active role? Do they want themselves to play a more active role? And allow for technology that's flexible enough to address that spectrum of needs and and preferences for what role people want to play in their own team. Um, my other question uh, may have to do with the fact that I missed this in the first part of your talk, but I'm very curious about it, so forgive me if you already explained this. But in the study of palliative care, um, I'm wondering with the video conferencing, if you also looked at and controlled for younger home care that the physician has for you, regardless of who provided it the number of home care hospice contact sites. Um, you mean by the agency, by the hospice because, nurse? Because in looking at 
Yeah. So our uh, video sessions were separate from the plan of care. So we were not delivering any services. No, we only delivered the problem solving therapy curriculum to the caregivers. So this could be done either in person or via video. Um, the actual hospice services were delivered by the hospice agency and we did not have data as to, you know, the number of visits and so forth. And, yeah, yeah. We did have um, enough agencies participate where we could control for that so that it wasn't biased by the way one agency delivered care. But you're right, we did not look into what other supportive services may have been provided in person. I also think with um, that work that uh, the, um, this is yet another example of how sometimes we conduct research to meet some NIH criteria. Uh, so clearly this was not a pragmatic trial, this was just a regular clinical trial. And so everybody who agreed to participate in the study was randomized whether they had high levels of anxiety or not. So as a result, we had caregivers who were extremely stressed and really needed to cope but didn't know how. And we also had caregivers who, you know, were not as stressed. They had perhaps were not that related to the patient. They moved in to fulfill the caregiving role, but they were not necessarily emotional in the same state as others. But everybody was getting the same curriculum with the same frequency. And um, that also may have played a role in why we couldn't figure out exactly what was working and what was not. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, so I'll tell you why a lot of animal avatars are being used, and that is because a lot of the systems also use artificial intelligence, where rather than a human at the other end, a computer is interacting with you. And people tend to be more forgiving when the response is nonsensical, when it's a pet that you're interacting with. So there is a study by a gentleman, his name is Tim Bitmore at Northwestern, I'm sorry, Northeastern in Boston. I always confuse the Northwestern with Northeastern. Anyway, he did a really interesting study where the avatar was a nurse and people would not, were not happy when the response was nonsensical. They were like, how can this be a nurse and say something so crazy? Whereas when the avatar is a pet and something doesn't go well with the algorithm uh, or, you know, the, the response isn't that helpful, people do tend to um, excuse a pet for not making too much sense. Um, in our case, the vendor also told us that it helped them because the responses were then converted to audible speech. And so they could use that voice that sounded like a cartoon voice. And so, um, one of the arguments of that, I don't know if they have any data for that, is that people um, may treat that um, more as a friend, that there was not, rather than let's say they're talking to a person and they were reserved, there was this cute cat or dog that spoke to them in a childish way and uh, was supposed to help them bond more. To be honest with you, I I'm uh, quite skeptical about some of the design choices that people make. Uh, with those digital avatars, but I did see that application that had the nurse for the conversation. It was a, um, actually a drawing of a nurse or a three-dimensional nurse, and um, uh, that also set the tone for the conversation to be uh, much more about clinical issues and more professional. And I think in this case, this vendor wanted it to be about people um, using that for fun and for you know, interacting. I guess that doesn't mean you have to be talking to a pet to do that. But yeah, I'm not really sure. Uh, but I do remember that the vendor did cite some literature that shows that people tend to uh, excuse artificial intelligence errors or lack of performance when it's coming from a pet. Okay. In the current education environment, there are really people who so many devices out there that tend to either access information or they do different aspects of social action and social media connections. What we tend to do is somehow either run behind a device or kind of copy that and or 
Yeah, so thank you for that question. I do think that in terms of um, um, uh, a framework, I do believe in a device agnostic approach. And actually we often say in my research group that we are technology agnostic in the sense that we should not be really thinking about, okay, we need to use something wearable, let's find a problem for that. Or we need to use Bluetooth, let's find what we can monitor. But rather have problems that are clinically driven by real needs and then figure out, and there may not be no, I mean, it doesn't mean that the technology will help. There may be a clinical need that technology simply cannot help us address. Um, so I do believe in, in uh, looking at it from a clinical rather than an engineering approach in terms of designing the solutions. The other bigger picture challenge that I think we have to explore as a group of researchers, practitioners, clinicians is, um, what do we see the role of patient-generated data? You know, there's quite a bit of controversy as to whether patient-generated data belong in the electronic medical record or not. And many clinicians will tell you about how horrible it is when people go in with their Fitbit data and demand that you look at them and do something with them. But on the other hand, we are promoting consumer tools and telling people to use them to better monitor their health and be actively engaged. So is there a framework or a protocol by which we would allow those data to be integrated? Uh, we now have also all these devices and apps that are not necessarily controlled by an entity because they're not medical devices, they're considered lifestyle tools, but yet people use them to make uh, conclusions about their sleep or their nutrition. So this is, I think, uh, in my mind, the bigger challenge. How do we... Uh, what do we see the role of patient-generated data and what conditions do those technologies or data sets need to fulfill? What type of rigorous testing do we need so that we could say this will become part of the clinical decision-making or who will be looking at this and why? Right now, it's kind of everybody's trying something and it's the chicken and the egg. We need to demonstrate that this works before it can be integrated into practice, but before it can be tested, we need to have the funds to test it and so forth. I'm not sure I answered your question, but basically to say that I do think we need to have a bigger picture framework as to what we're doing. In our own work, those three different examples were driven by theoretical frameworks, but in all of those cases were not uh, technology frameworks. So in the first one, the problem solving therapy was uh, from caregiver stress uh, theoretical framework. The second study with the smart comes had to do with aging in place as a model. And the third one with the conversational agents had to do with social isolation. The idea is here that technology can be plugged into these frameworks as a tool that accelerates some of the processes within the framework. Okay. Because you're using technology, can you communicate with these companies? Because they have different objectives. Yes. So are they integrating, like, oh, the when the study ends, they're going to lose a pet, right? Mm -hmm. That's attachment style. Mm -hmm. So, do you, do they listen to you when you get to the public? How do you know they do it? Yeah. So, um, this is a great question. We have uh, worked both with commercially available systems as well as some engineers who develop new technologies. And so, we've done some work with water sensors and electricity sensors by academic groups that develop the sensors and they obviously want to test because they want to figure out what would work and so forth. With commercially available partners, commercially available products or vendors, those partnerships are often used where uh, we do provide that feedback and hope that it will get integrated um, in the redesign and improvement of the systems. We always have, whenever we've partnered with vendors, 
uh, pretty extensive uh, documents for a memorandum of understanding in terms of us being able to publish negative findings, but then also for them to have um, some benefit in terms of receiving a formative and a summative evaluation report. I would say some vendors are very open to um, implementing recommendations in the redesign of their system. Uh, even the vendor with the digital pad made several changes before the next iteration. Um, we have, for example, something that they fixed immediately. The pad, uh, when it slept, it was snoring, uh, and they thought that this was a soothing effect. And all our participants were calling us saying, please make that snoring stop. Uh, and they did it right away. I mean, that's an easy thing to fix, but they also implemented things that uh, we found out in the study. Sometimes there are competing interests. And so I wouldn't say that consistently all vendors, you know, implement our recommendations. We had a partnership with a fault detection device, which I didn't present because it didn't, it wasn't that happy with the partnership where um, our specificity and sensitivity measures were significantly worse than their lab readings, and there wasn't much there to improve, rather than to say that system works less effective than throwing a coin. So, um, yeah, in that case, I wouldn't say so. But I would say a lot of vendors, however, are interested in improving their system and do take some of those recommendations into, um, that translate them into a new redesign. Any more questions? Okay, well, thank you. Thank you.